You're listening to On Mission with Dr. Matt Davis, a podcast designed to explore the personal mission of everyday leaders. Hear from men and women who are making a difference in their corner of the world and discover what keeps them on mission. Welcome to On Mission. I am Dr. Matt Davis. Our guest today is John Bladeen, director of Longview Camp in Arcade, New York. John and his wife, Stephanie, have four children ranging in age from four to 11 years old. So they have a busy household. John's first job was in groundskeeping in the seventh grade. So child labor going on there. That's good. We'll have to explore that a little bit legally. His favorite meal is steak and fries. Man, we are on a roll with the steak favorite meal, and it's making me hungry already. John enjoys beekeeping, metal detecting, woodworking, and gardening. John, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's so to be here. you got a, you got a diverse range of hobbies I do. there. <laughs> so, I do. Have you ever found anything interesting with your like metal detecting? No, nothing crazy. I found a couple old silver coins, um, and that was probably the most. How how old is old when you find something um, like that? I think the oldest thing I found is like 1910 or something like that. So not really All right. not really that old, but over 100 years old. That's yes. not nothing. Yep. No like Spanish pieces of eight or anything. <laughs> you know, most of my metal detecting was in the state of Wisconsin, so oh, okay. there's probably not too many gold doubloons <laughs> here in Wisconsin. Uh, you never know. You maybe, never maybe, know. maybe the Vikings, they, they made it a long ways across. They probably did. They have actually found some Viking artifacts in Minnesota. Okay. And I'm thinking, you know, they must have gone through Wisconsin. Like, at like some do they have point. a football on them? Or no, they, no they're, they're <laughs> that, that stupid different. horn they play every <laughs> first down. It's like you know, I would understand if they had just the Vikings would just play that horn when they score a touchdown. Yep, it's obnoxious though. After every, are you a Vikings fan? I am not. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a nominal Packers fan because I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, so if they get close, the I will start will like cheering that. for them. Okay, well, so. I don't think you have anything to worry about this year. <laughs> <laughs> so also woodworking have you made anything interesting um it most of it ends up being practical stuff so i have a you know a nice wood shop in my basement but yeah it's just fixing stuff so how did you learn how to do it because isaiah and i were talking right before the show today about how everything we learned either from our dad you know holding yeah. the flashlight watching dad work and helping him or you know just you, you need to do it and you look it up and figure it out right right it's probably a combination. So okay. I grew up in a family of um, eight kids, oldest of eight kids. and You're uh, the oldest of eight. I'm the oldest of eight. Nice. And uh, so <laughs> when I was in college, my folks bought a house. Um, they always, housing was provided as part of their compensation. And then they okay. decided to buy their own house. So First family time. of 10. Yeah. 900 square foot ho- farmhouse. <laughs> Are 10 you people. Kidding? One no. bathroom. No. And uh, and so we took in over six years that nine hundred square foot house went from um, went to twenty seven hundred square feet. So the attic got tore off. We put a second floor on. We actually yeah. jacked the house up, put a basement <laughs> underneath it, and then we put an, a kitchen addition on. And anything, I mean, uh, they're a ministry family, and, yeah. uh, and so budget was tight. So anything that we could do, yep, we did. Right. And uh, so then you just got, I mean chainsawing down the old roof over top of your head and all sorts of crazy stuff oh yeah what could possibly go wrong Um, at some point your dad had to look back and go you know it might have been easier just to build a new one at this point (laughs) he would do the same thing now i'm sure he would so anyways but like i mean part of that is like he just always had he loved he enjoyed woodworking but it was usually just small stuff you know building you know he would build simple furniture for the house and things like that. so as the oldest you were definitely like apprentice number one yeah but we could just use his tools that was the nice thing yeah so i mean at sixth grade i was using a table saw and uh whatever random thing i want if i wanted to make a birdhouse i just go in a shop just 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 use a table saw. you had supplies right there yep i had no idea how much lumber costs because i was the same way i just go raid my dad's stash in the garage if we're going to build a tree house or something like that my cousin and I, we built a fort up in the trees in the mm-hmm. woods between our houses when I was growing up. And uh, we had a lot of rules in that club. You know, now that I look <laughs> back, like I was like litigating that whole club, you know, but that's that's awesome. So you kind of just learned. And have you used that even in ministry along the way? Uh, when we got to Longview, it's a camp restart. And uh, for a camp that's been around for 60, 70 years, they didn't have hardly any tools. So mm-hmm. my, my wood shop for the first couple of years was Camp's wood shop. So, I mm-hmm. mean, they didn't, there wasn't even a chop saw there. So uh, <laughs> first couple of years, it was like, 
Uh, and it was in the it was in our basement, which we lived right on the we lived right on the property at the time. So yeah. I'd have to ask my wife like, okay, when when's the baby waking up? Because we don't want to start the table saw up in the basement until yeah. after the nap's over. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but I'll do fun stuff too. I have a lathe, and so yeah. occasionally I'll you know do pens and and things like that, which is a little more creative and not as um, just utility. Utili- yeah. yeah, utilitarian. Yeah, yeah. So well, camp work always involves you know, resourcefulness, uh, what can we do with what we have? You know, how can we right. make this fun? Safety is always like maybe third, fourth in the consideration. You, <laughs> you sound know? like Mike Rowe. Safety well, third. Safety uh, third, yep. <laughs> Although he has a real philosophy about that. I I can appreciate that part of it too. But yeah, as a lawyer, I'm not quite sure. But also then just like randomly beekeeping, which sounds dangerous. I mean, I follow this guy on YouTube that goes after those uh, like killer bees that are invading. Okay. You know? And uh, he's kind of an interesting guy. <laughs> All this stuff is live streamed, and I'm pretty sure someday <laughs> the live stream is just gonna like the camera focused on this like motionless guy. <laughs> That'll be his viral video the, when the, he's like running like crazy. Yeah, to when the bees away. won, you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, but yeah. So hopefully not anything too dangerous, but. You enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, it sounds like a nightmare I, to me. <laughs> I, I, as a kid, I always thought it was cool, and I never got a chance to do it. Um, but one of my pastor friends mentioned uh, a couple years ago, he said, it's my observation that a lot of guys in ministry um, have hobbies where there's actually a visible result. So there's guys yep. that are woodworkers, and they get to create something. They have something at the end. Um, I have a friend that he's a, I mean, he grows a garden like you would not believe i mean but but in ministry you don't you don't get to see like in many businesses i can i can we made this profit you know yep. we we did this big addition to the company Easy to we assess hired all these people your success and ministry um the eternal is hard you can't see the eternal and uh so i think sometimes having a hobby where you know we did i did probably 12 to 13 gallons of honey this summer out of my five hives and um I, it's too much honey yeah. i have a five gallon bucket of honey in my basement i'm like i don't know what i'm gonna do with this thing um and uh but, i have a five gallon bucket of golf balls okay. so <laughs> i should have brought some to trade yeah. um, but anyways but it is fun to it's fun to, to sometimes see the fruit of your labor because in ministry we're just called to be faithful yeah. And and the fruit is up to the Lord. And uh, sometimes we get to see the harvest, but many times we don't. And so I think that's that's many many guys in ministry have some sort of hobby that has some some tangible result to it. That might be just a man thing overall. Probably. Um, maybe it's just a human thing. I don't know. I have to ask my wife if she <laughs> looks at the world the same way. <laughs> but you do want to have some tangible, fulfilling result that you can look at. I mean, I think we're just hardwired that way. Right. But you're right. In ministry, so many times, it's it, because it's a people business and because right. it's an eternal thing, we won't necessarily see the fruit of that. I suppose at the ultimate level, it's still worth it and fulfilling, mm-hmm. obviously. But I think in the here and now, it probably does help to have some thing on the side. Right. The other thing about your hobbies is that they all have a tendency to support like a contemplative, almost isolated nature to them you know you're not having too many conversations when the table saw is running or no. when you're out there in the beekeeper's uniform or even <laughs> doing the metal detecting <laughs> you got your headphones on uh do you enjoy that to kind of unplug and get away and sort of think about things metal detecting i usually try to take my kids with me so, okay um so you, you don't have to have headphones you just oh. can't be obnoxious with all the people around well you. everyone around you going. would prefer you had the headphones you know, okay beep, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that on the beach, and it's like, dude, the, the, the would you please? Is everyone else's kids are like, ooh, what's that? And then yeah. you have everyone digging. I'm like, no, that's my quarter. That get away, I found, get away. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you never found like an engagement ring or anything cool like no, that? No. Oh. I haven't done many beaches. So there yeah. is a funny story. So Dave Handyside was our education dean here at Maranatha. He retired from that position a few years ago. And he and his wife, after getting married when they were young, they were at Camp Assurance. Do you know Camp Assurance I, down there, in yep. Illinois? Okay, so that was my camp growing up, like okay. just right outside Danville. And they were they had a camp work day, as one does. And somehow raking leaves around the pool area, his wedding ring flies off. He doesn't notice, okay, until much later. They, of course, desperate search, you know, to try and find it. Never found it. Just an absolute gut-wrenching, you know, he, he mm-hmm. felt so terrible about it. I think it was like 20 years later, another work day, they're breaking leaves, and somebody goes, hey, what's that? 
and reaches down and finds his wedding band. That's crazy. <laughs> and somebody had been there long enough. I don't know if it was Scott Randolph or somebody like remembered vaguely. Hey, that might have be uh, Dave Handyside's <laughs> ring. Maybe he had That's it engraved. Awesome. I don't know. But they got it back to him like decades later. Yeah. Um, Wow, that that's you, know, you, you cool. could be that guy. You could I, I be could, a hero. I could. I don't do very. I. I mean, the beekeeping is the one that <laughs> I'm doing right now. Okay. Um, the other ones is kind of sporadic. Gotcha. Um, metal detecting at camp the last couple of years is mostly more utilitarian. To like, we, lo we lost the tooth for the w excavator bucket somewhere yep. in this 50 foot trench. I'm like, well, let me go get my metal detector. <laughs> or we don't know where the corner pin is for the property line over here, and yeah. we're using tape measures and metal detectors trying to find a metal post driven in the ground somewhere somewhere so. yeah that pin is somewhere so all right fun. so enough with the hobbies <laughs> now i hit you with a deep question okay all right what is your mission in life what is my mission in life um i have a couple i guess i you call them core values just guiding guiding principle statements um uh from the top uh it's not my life my life is christ steward it well um, really is, is how I would uh, look at life. And, uh, and when I remember that it's not, it's not my life. I'm, I'm just a steward of this life of the resources of the abilities that he has given to me. Um, and then under, under the stewardship, part of it is obviously my family. So, uh, I need to lead my family well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, really for me, it comes down to family, church, um, and then the ministry God's called me to. So, um, we're, part of a, a little country church, which uh, folks out in Wisconsin are probably used to a lot of those. So a yeah. uh, really full Sunday is where, 70. I don't have any clue so, where Arcade, am I saying Arcade, right? Arcade, yeah. Arcade, Arcade New, New York. York. We're about an hour south of Buffalo, New York. So okay. Western New York. So people think, snow. they think New York, New York City's <laughs> no. six hours away. Yeah. So, um, and it's a very different state <laughs> on it, that side. It actually feels like the Midwest. Yeah. I mean, we're in the middle of major dairy farm countries. So all the farms around us there. have a thousand, two thousand milk, milking cows and horses, all yeah, that. Yeah. So it's big, huge rolling hills. Um, so it's a beautiful country, but most of the people are very growing up in Wisconsin, I'm like, these are fairly Midwestern type, you know, very practical, mm -hmm. um, far farmers and mechanics and, and that type of folks. So, so where, where, what's the area that your camp draws campers from? Um, the big How cities far? would be Buffalo, Rochester. We've really, as we're rebuilding a camp, um, really we're only in the hour, hour, two hour range, mm -hmm. um, working out to build relationships with churches. So the, and there's enough churches. The, the to potential draw. out there yeah. is within four hours is probably two hundred plus churches that we potentially are on the same page with that we could serve. That's a good network. That's so, a good size network. Um so we're building that network, yeah. but there's it's really uh the potential is really huge. Yeah. So your your first core value was not my life. I belong to the Lord, steward it well. Yep. And that breaks down into yeah, so somewhat of a priority of family, church, and mm -hmm. ministry. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to church, um, one of the things my wife and I, as we talk about church, um, for us, we our church should be better because of our family's involvement. So we want to be a True. contributor mm. uh, to our church, and not like we're we're change we're not really changing our church, but when it comes to visitors and being friendly and. Um, just encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ. Like we're trying to be intentional just as, as a local family in mm -hmm. our local church. Not and to say you don't get something out of it yourself, but that that's not really the main reason why you're there. Correct. Um, Interesting. So, cause a lot of people just come and they're just a, it's sit consumer mindset, like sit, enjoy the music. It's you know, ruining the church. You worship. And then there's yeah. a couple people just wearing themselves out serving and we want to be part of the, the serving side of things. For sure. Was so. there another core value that you? Um, really, that's that's the only okay. one. Um, okay. I guess I guess uh, do what's right and trust God for the outcome. Uh, there's so many times when you're weighing things and the costs of things, whether time or finances, and um, the practical side of you is like, but this is going to hurt. <laughs> 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 I don't yeah. have time for this, or uh, and uh, and it comes on the camp ministry side too, uh, with a little camp with limited resource and. Uh, and you're like, no, this is the best way to show God's love to this person or the best way to take care of this person. Even if it's going to, I don't know where the finances or the time is going to come from that I'm taking um, to jump in here and uh, to do what's right. Trust God for the outcome. And mm -hmm. he's never, 
there's never been a time when we've given towards something or we've invested in someone that we look back and say, Oh, I really wish I would have done that. Like, you know, you know, but like there's that, yeah. in, that inward struggle of, well, let's, I'm not sure let's if I want to do that. Let, let's be honest. <laughs> Sometimes generosity can be taken advantage of. Right. But if you let that affect your generous impulses, then you'll draw right. back and you maybe even resist the Holy Spirit's leading to do something right. that he wants you to do. But you're like, well, I don't want to get burned or right. I got burned before. I, the, the the simple fact that you learn later in life is you will be taken advantage of right. if you live generously right. and give of yourself, whether it's money, whether it's your time. And we've probably all been burned that way. Mm-hmm. And so then that can cause you to get a little callous to the needs right. around you and, and staying tender hearted towards things that you can do or what the Lord might lead you to do. Um, is something that you have to actively maintain, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Which goes back to that starting statement. It's yeah. not my life. It's not my stuff. It's not my time. It, so if they take advantage of me, it's really not me. Right. It's, right. Okay. And, and a gift. Yeah. I mean, many times we're like, <laughs> it was a gift, and it was given to the Lord. And I had this conversation responsible before the Lord for however they. I had this that. conversation with someone last week. Okay. And we were talking about the fact that they had donated someone who had a need, and they had put out that they had this health need and so they they gave towards it and then the next thing they know they kind of see on social media which ruins you know almost everything (laughs) right but they see on social media this person has bought like some new stuff and it had nothing to do with the health need and they're like right now wait a minute (laughs) you know and the thing they bought was nicer than the one the donor had you know that kind of deal and so it it can mess with your head if you have the wrong mentality if you have the owner's mentality then that'll cause you to be, to draw back from right. that, won't it? But on the flip side, when it comes to donations to camp, yeah, you, like once you give don't it, worry. To, once you give it to us, <laughs> don't worry about yeah, it. If, it's going to be if used. it's not a gift, then you just keep it. You know, yeah. like if you expect to see this item here thirty years from now, <laughs> that was some precious item of your grandma's that you didn't want to keep, but you gave to us. Um, don't no. don't give it to us. So. But but where else could you see more impact? more immediate impact than to give and support camp ministry. I mean, you right. you talk about areas where the Lord is working, where hearts are being changed, lives are being changed. Uh, to me, that's one of the greatest places to invest, if you're going to yeah. say invest, um, resources, whether it's time. I mean, you rely, don't you, on a lot of volunteer help yes. and a lot of donations, because I would imagine – the camper fees probably doesn't pay all the bills, right? I nope. mean, that's not where it's going to come from. No. Nope. So you talked about doing what's right, ministry. It's all about you know just trusting the Lord for for the outcome, and I, I guess these are principles that could apply to anybody in any walk of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, you went on. You went to Bible college. Yes. Um, Northland. Yes. Right? Yep. Am I right about that? I had that in my head. All right. So I had to, <laughs> uh, and I wasn't holding it against you either. Like that yep. was, you know, that, that's fine. It's, it's, okay. it's fine. My dad's an alumnus of Maranatha. So if that, well, that, I'm not sure that makes better. your choice better. Okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's some questions here. Now, I, see, I wasn't going to hold it against you, but now I'm thinking about it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you go to go off to Northland, which is probably a good fit. Like Northland back in the day when you were there, mm-hmm. very much about, the sort of rugged ministry, give it all to the Lord. We're going to make a man out of you. <laughs> you know, you're going to come up here and be a, like the pioneer was their yes. mascot. And that was for real. Mm-hmm. Uh, middle of nowhere. Uh, not that the campus wasn't nice. I mean, it was right. very nice, but um, not close to a Walmart, we'll, we'll nope. say. And so that kind of fit, you, you found that fit pretty well with your what you were wanting to do. Did you always know like camp work is what I want to get into or how did that come no, about? I was actually a missionary aviation major. Um, okay. And so I I did the flying, all that stuff. I fi- I thought I was going to be in South America flying airplanes um, and missions like down the there. Like Jim Elliott type. Pretty yeah, much. Here we go. That Gates was, of Splendor. Yep. <laughs> that was the, except for the dying part. Well, um, <laughs> hopefully that's not the, yeah. Um, but, but uh, that's, and it was the Lord, the Lord just slowly closed doors. So I graduated with that yeah. and I was trying to go into other areas of aviation and, uh, he just closed all the doors, just made wouldn't... me stay for a master's of biblical studies. And I didn't really want to do that. I was working in audiovisual technology at the time as a grad student. 
Um, so I love this. This is cool. <laughs> you can um, come help so us ra- out. We, we had the radio podcast yep. or radio broadcast and stuff. They had a nice studio. I remember yes, yep. seeing that a few times. Yep. They had quite so a I got to I got to edit a lot of the radio programs mm-hmm. that they sent around the world and things like that. So that was really cool. Um, and then I ended up um, traveling with an evangelist for a year. Okay. Um, and I uh, got to kind of see cross section of oh, the churches yeah. of the United States. There's a and, broad range uh, in there. <laughs> and and you really get burdened for for yeah. local churches when you're in a new church every week mm-hmm. and you're you, you see a pastor that's overwhelmed and you're like no one's reaching out to his teens but he's already got his plate full of so many. And then and then the hard part for me was you're there for a week but then you, gotta leave. you leave. And you're like Just when you they, get to know he people. needs help, you know. <laughs> um, the, these teens need need these help need help. And uh, what was your was it a singing group or what was um, your what was that Fraser evangelistic team? Yeah, Fraser. Jeremy okay. Fraser. And uh, so I was a children's evangelist and then played guitar and did the audiovisual stuff for the team as well, the sound system nice. stuff. So, so are you married at this point? Did you meet your wife in Northland? I, I was single okay. in my mid twenties. Yeah. Um, so he actually visited. We we did a week at Ironwood where he preached for mm-hmm. a camp, and uh, I met the guys at Ironwood and ended up going out there and joined their internship program for two years. Well, when when I first met you and your name first came up here, you were at Wolf Mountain, right? Yes. Yeah. And Wolf Mountain is part of the what do they call it? The family of camps. The family of right? camps. They kind of springs out of the ironwood orbit okay yes. yep. Yep. <laughs> how far is wolf mountain from ironwood uh, about eight hours eight hours like north straight into north. california okay mm-hmm. so very different type of camp i it would is. guess so yep. tell us a little bit about wolf mountain when your time there because that was a little bit of a start restart yeah too, wasn't so, it? so i've been part of three yeah. camp restarts so okay. wolf mountain uh they had 600 acres <laughs> um and the camp hadn't ever fully closed but it was on the yeah. verge of closing um but under previous under like, management. previous management yeah. you mm-hmm. know a different philosophy of ministry mm-hmm. and uh so that we went up with two couples and we had a couple other staff uh on that on that camp and it was the same thing it's like you you come in and you assess like all right what do we what do we have what don't we have how can we best use this and then you know, and it was deferred maintenance, so kind of like oh. Longview, but not uh, not near the extent of um, of things falling into disrepair. But they had tons of deferred maintenance because, as with any business or ministry that starts to go tight financially, the first mm-hmm. thing that usually goes is maintaining, because that's very costly. So yeah, the roof is patched, you know, but it needs to be replaced. Type of what thing. can we do to get by? Kind exactly. of deal instead of really doing the expensive repairs that might right. come up. And so that camp, what what is the area like? You said 600 acres. I mean, I've been to Ironwood. They're, they're I've never the been to Wolf Mountain. Foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. Ooh, um, I bet that's so just it's, beautiful. It, it's beautiful. It's yeah. not it's not mountains, but they're definitely. I mean, it's called Wolf Mountain for a reason. Mm. So I mean, <laughs> there's right in the middle of camp. There's a road that goes up like this. You know, oh, it's boy. like okay, everyone up to the the swimming pool, and you're like, <laughs> you know, so. oh, they put the swimming pool on the yeah, top of the hill because okay. there's not much flat spot. So you like yeah. every, you know, otherwise the, cab- the, the campers would at- never go up there. They're like I ain't going up there. Yeah, cabins are at the flat spot here. Pool and basketball ho- ho- courts are flat. Good spot idea. There. Put the fun stuff up there. <laughs> wow. But, so yeah. that, but that probably had its own challenges to work around the terrain and it did. Yeah, it did. Um, but no, it was a, it was a great, great facility. Facility and then mm-hmm. learning how to you know serve churches and uh, that's really the core of of what we do. Um, we're here to reach young people with the gospel, strengthen families, and serve local churches. And how can we do those things? Do those things well. So now I have to pick up my previous question. All right, so yes. you were single. I got on the married. Team. I got married then right before up... we went to Wolf Mountain. So my wife was an intern at Ironwood as well. So I met Man, her. And they at get Ironwood. credit for a lot of marriages, don't they? I, I've heard of a lot of people that camp. met their spouse at camp. Camp is a good filter if you're <laughs> ministry minded because they're not usually. If Christian there for college the money. didn't work out, exactly. then you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then you if plan four, B. If four years at Marion yep. don't work. Go work at camp. Well. North, Northland. Four years at Northland didn't work. Oh, that's it true. always works at Marinette. No, that's it doesn't. <laughs> I did not meet my spouse at Marinette. Uh, okay, so you, you met her there, and was it just like obvious uh, love at first sight for both of you, or did one of you need convincing, or how did that all um, unfold? I'm always kind of curious like how these uh, matches are made. I, t- I probably took about six months to you know, just start talking, and um, yeah. It's one of those awkward conversations. Hey, I like you. Is that okay? 
<laughs> like a little note. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're a exactly. little old for if, this. If, if that's not okay, then uh, I guess I'm, I'm moving on. Was but... she from California? No, she's from Pennsylvania. Oh, so, so. you both are out in California as transplants yes. at that point. Yep. All right. Yep. So then you're married, and that's when you went to Wolf Mountain. Yes. So yep. that's quite an adventure as newlyweds. It, so it was. It was. To so the great unknown. I was a new program director. She ran the office. She ran the horse program and uh, hit the ground hit the ground running. We were there for five years. So Wow. Um, yeah. And that was that was an exciting adventure. Now, the problem is you don't have hardly any family around there, do you? Right. So is, is your family starting to grow during that five years? That's where... Yeah, we had the our first, first ones. Were first, born. first couple kids were out there. Yeah, and that that can be a challenge, can it? Yeah, yeah. We we, we I did recruit my sister as an intern. So okay. I brought a sister. A little bit of help. Got a brother out as an. Well, nice you had a bunch a to family. choose from. <laughs> so every camp I work at, for the okay. first you know first eight years, I'm like, hey, you should come be a counselor. Hey, there you, you should come work at camp. So okay. then, then they grow out of that, and then you're like, man, now I got to wait for my kids to grow up. Well, keep them coming. You know, you only got four. You got a few left to yeah, I don't know. spots we'll to fill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you go. At some point, the Lord opens the door. You say, okay, I've been here for five years. The Lord opens the door for you to move to a, a new ministry. Where, mm-hmm. where was that? So it was Northland, yeah. actually. So the school and the camp had closed down, and they were getting that restarted. And being a place, so I grew up at Northland. So my mm-hmm. folks were on staff there for 25 years. And uh, especially the camp ministry, um, the Lord used the camp ministry in my life in just so many ways in spiritual growth. Mm-hmm. And I remember as a third grader, obviously I'm passionate about camp a little bit, um, yeah. but as a third grader going out of uh, chapel, praying with my counselor on the, the grass, just sitting down and praying yeah. to the Lord, Lord, whatever you want me to do, wow. I will do. And you say, well, what, you know, what really impact can camp have in an eight-year-old's life? And as I look back across my life, Obviously, there's many times that I didn't do what God wanted me to do, but that really was the overarching. No, I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do, wow. and uh, and so that's you know as as they're going, the school is going through struggles and all that sort of stuff, and everything's closing down. And then I hear that yeah. they're trying to restart. Um, the Lord would just not take it off off our hearts, and we'd finally. I mean, after five years at a at a camp or a ministry or business, like things were starting to get to be smooth sailing. You know, like it's running like a well oiled machine after four years, and um, the Lord would just not take it off our hearts. So we called mm. them up and said, "Hey, would you need a program person? Like we've we've prayed about this. Uh, if you don't, great. We're happy where we're at, but." the Lord put on our heart. And so then we moved out in December. Great time to move to Wisconsin, by the way, is December. Uh, uh, I moved here in February. So, yeah, so about you know, the same. Yeah. <laughs> Especially from California. You're like... I moved from Florida. There you so. go. You know, you know. Yeah, yeah but, maybe not, right? Uh, but you knew what you were getting into. That's true. And, I mean, Northland Camp, legendary, mm-hmm. right? I mean, people that have been there speak like this was a life-changing place and it really was for many yes. many generations of campers i don't know how long it had been there i think it'd been there before the college even yes the, the camp yeah. and uh it was just like horrifying to think that there wouldn't be a northland camp right and so everyone was just hoping that that would be able to be restarted and and that the the ministry would uh stay right you mm-hmm. know because that's always the pressure too right. the, the deferred maintenance is one pressure right mission drift is the other pressure right. and you think well what do we have to do to survive and if survival is your only uh desire your only mission then you'll do whatever it takes to right. survive including compromise right. and so everybody was was just cheering on those mm-hmm. that said hey like yourselves right. hey we want to we want to revitalize this thing and re restart it I think there was maybe one summer that they didn't really have much. Right. Maybe they had a, like a couple of things, but right. it just didn't seem like a normal, you know, right. Northland camp normal. summer. And then it was like, okay, right back to it. Let's get right. this thing going. And that was that was part of our heart as well, like a place that has impacted my life. I'm like, yeah. well, as a restarting stuff, if Lord wants me to be part of that, then right. the things that I'm like, no, this this is what made this ministry or how this ministry impacted my life. I would like that same. Um, that same see, philosophy we, to be part of yeah, it restarting. It has to be the same philosophy because right. without you, guys like you, then all you have is a name and some land. Right. And and that's not Northland. That's not what right. that's not the ministry. You know, so the, any the, any <laughs> ministry any ministry though, yeah. any ministry, doesn't matter if it's a local church, if it's a college, university, um, what makes it that that place, what makes it special is the people. 
So you could take that same group of people, professors, students, you stick them someplace else. The same core of that ministry is the people. So we take the people out. Yep, the the exactly place is right. just an empty, empty place. And I know there's memories of like, I mean, I'm like, yeah, over there on the grass, that's where I prayed with my counselor. But at the end of the day, it was the counselor. It wasn't the piece of grass yeah. that we sat it's on. A, it's a balance, right? Because even like we think about the Old Testament, there were times when God sold his people, hey, put up some memorial stones here to remember right. what I did. Mm-hmm. But the memorial stones, th- there was always that balance of don't let that become an idol. Right. Okay, and then how many times did they <laughs> cross that line and start worshiping <laughs> the ground or the place mm-hmm. instead of the remembrance of what God did there, keeping exactly. God on the throne and not this place as an idol? And, I mean, honestly, I know we're kind of treading on thin ice here, but because uh, <laughs> I'm at Maranatha, and, yeah. you know, I'm from Maranatha, but we're not. that doesn't make us against what's happening, what right. God's doing at other places, mm-hmm. right? So... Um, I think without being disloyal to Maranatha, I can cheer for another ministry to be right. successful, and we do. But there was a time, even through those years, those difficult years, where that was very much in doubt. Yes. And, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that God called yourself and, and I would say dozens of other people mm-hmm. even now since in the years since. And we have Maranatha grads that are there even now serving right. the Lord faithfully. And we can be happy and rejoice in that because, in a way, it's like a redemption story. You know, it's it like, okay, there were some rough uh, interim there transition, but thank God for what's happening. Cause that's real. I mean, th- what happens when you have a ministry decline or a ministry close is that people will have a tendency to second guess everything about that, what that ministry accomplished. And right. they might even, God forbid question, was it real? What happened with me spiritually? Like you mm-hmm. would look back and say, man, it really seemed like that was God's hand of blessing. But now It's not there. Does that mean God wasn't ever there? Right. And, you know, God forbid that that be the thought. So it's good to see the revitalization work going on. And I'm sure it was good for you to be a part of it, although probably bittersweet. Yeah, because I'm sure when you arrived different, you know, I was there that that end of that summer, the summer off. Right. Mm -hmm. Where there was like one guy left on campus. And things had really run down. I mean, honestly, yes, because because it's very self-contained. I mean, they have a wastewater management and yep. all that stuff Their has got to be tower. maintained. I mean, the IT stuff was pretty gutted. Yes. I mean, it was not in good shape. And I'm looking around, going, "This is weird." It was like a ghost town, yep. you know. And I'm thinking of all the activity that was there, and it was just gone. It was yep. very eerie mm-hmm. uh, to see it in that in that shape. So. I'm sure there's a lot more life going on yeah. <laughs> you know, these days, and you were a part of that uh, that revitalization of really the camp part. Right. Yeah, just focus on, focus on the camp. Yeah. So. so how long were you there at North? So we were there two and a half years. Just the two and so, a half years. So our goal was to be there five years. So we're like, we just want to come in, be involved, mm-hmm. try to you know, help create some of the ministry culture, ministry philosophy. Um, I, I came in as the program director, and, and my goal— um, just looking at the way God has gifted me um, was to eventually look for a camp that I could be the the camp director. And I've learned a lot of a lot, several different camps. Now let's you know try to try to learn and grow and and be a leader for you know the long term. So we're hoping planning that long view. I keep I've been telling people plan on being here for twenty years, and we've been there seven. And uh, I still say twenty years. So I guess we'll <laughs> we should be there for a while. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things I learned, um, both Northland and Wolf Mountain, that really prepared for, for Longview is um, when you have the limited resources, mm. um, what can we do with what we have? And, and so that's some, sometimes it's and, – uh, and different people have different perspectives of debt and business and, yeah. and things like that. But um, there's nothing more scary than to have this big loan – Oh yeah, uh, hanging over your head and not knowing how you're gonna how you're gonna handle that, and uh, so like, what can we do with what we have? And we'll be patient, and when God yep. provides, you know. So yeah. and and so it's there's there's kind of a little bit of I guess probably growing up in our family of eight and renovating our house and all that sort of <laughs> stuff probably set some of that mindset as sure. I look back. Um, but even even a, a long view, um, you started with a, a falling down facility, and we're like, okay, and it's just like almost like triage, like. Okay, what funds do we have? Not very much. What can we fix? What can we do with what we have? Is Longview part um, of the family of camps? It is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So Wolf Mountain was the first yeah. kind of camp restart mm-hmm. um, of the family camps, and Longview is the third. 
uh, camp that they've uh, partnered Cause with. Because we talked about Camp Assurance. I think they've joined yes, the fold yep, now, they too. Just, they just joined as well. <laughs> so I, I will say it's a lot nicer to be the third child than the first child. Okay. Um, <laughs> Some of the growing pains. Because as an know. oldest child, knowing yeah. the parents like, ooh, look, new, new discipline book. Let's try this one out. Let's try this one out, you know. And then you look at the third child like, wait, you get away with all sorts of stuff. Um, not that we're getting away with stuff. Also, we're, you know, uh, many more years mature and experienced, but... Um, Longview really have had a it's it's been really really good to yeah. be able to I have people I can reach out to but they're like no oh, you can go you you're can part take of it something a go. little bigger you're not a lone ranger out on your own right. there it's not that I don't know if they supplement the the budget or bail you out if you go in the not wrong really. direction probably not that <laughs> kind of support but at least there's a network of encouragement prayer support mm-hmm. certainly wisdom you can yep. draw from. Yep. And and really the example of success yes. that you can look at as well. And yes. not everything that they do in Southern California is going to translate to upstate right. New York. <laughs> so you're you're in a little different <laughs> geographic environment. Especially plumbing. Don't put plumbing in <laughs> exterior walls in upstate New York. So well, and I I would imagine you can't do, you know, a year round camping set up exactly the same type of schedule. That kind a of little thing. bit different. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But. For sure. So as you have now stepped into leadership, I wonder what you would, how you would reflect on the difference between being sort of the program side, which as I look at a camp setup, and I'm just an outsider looking mm-hmm. in, but I'm an organizational guy, so I, I like to study these things. Your, the, your program guy is kind of the happy fun time, let's make it fun. I mean, kids have to want to come to camp, right. and part of that is selling them on, you know, these fun activities and some of the craziest activities. Yes. You know, back in my day, it was just big ball volleyball. You know, and nowadays <laughs> they got all kinds of crazy things going on that lawyers cringe over. You know, yes. uh, you you program guys are right next to youth pastors in like the the paradigm of hate. You know, when it comes to lawyers, <laughs> like oh, they're gonna kill us. You know, they're always coming up with some crazy thing, uh, but. That's the sort of fun ex- part of the experience. Then you got the op staff, which is like keeping the lawn mowed and the yep. machines running and mm-hmm. all maintenance and all that. And then I don't know what is the, what would you call the third one? Like the counseling and the personnel side and the the, the, the yep. spiritual ministry yep. side. I don't know if there's a Just name count- for it. counseling staff. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of counseling and interpersonal and some big time challenges but that's really where a lot of the eternal work is being done right but dealing with college students that you recruit and sort of all that that side of it so are those kind of the three subdivisions or am i missing yep, one pretty much okay pretty much so now you go from the fun program side of it to being the director and this isn't your first rodeo you've had plenty of mentoring and you know you've seen right. it now probably done well not done so well you know you've learned from those good and bad examples and now you're the director so how do you reflect on the new role in that kind of leadership position we had a huge staff of two yeah i got there so i was still the the whole team i was still the program director (laughs) um (laughs) actually no i I wasn't we had the guy the guy that was there he was program director the one other guy was now the the lord moved them on oh no and so then i become the program director as well as the director um but i mean there's for me the um the business side of things was a a pretty good learning curve so i'm a pretty organized i'm a planner um but the the business uh so at northland i had started they had asked me to start doing some of the bookkeeping so the Mm -hmm. first time that i ever done bookkeeping and uh, so the Lord knew what he was doing. They didn't cover that in your missionary aviation yeah, they undergrad? Did, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> I think I had how to balance a checkbook in high school. Well, there you go. And nobody even uses That's a checkbook It's more than most anymore. American kids get. <laughs> exactly. They're like, what's uh, a checkbook? <laughs> so, that, so that was, you know, intro, intro to QuickBooks would have been a great class to take. Um, but it was pretty much trial by, trial by fire. And I'm still, I mean, I pretty much got most of it down at this point. Um, and the Lord just brought another staff family on. So now I only do half of the books which is that's actually which, better which yeah. is amazing i mean it's, it's also best practice yeah but, um, <laughs> Separate when it's, those. Well, there's only two of you and the other guy has other responsibilities it's like well yeah the, the thing is if you're at a nonprofit ministry and the ministry goes under because you mismanaged funds like you're just shooting yourself in the foot there's anyway, nobody you know? <laughs> to point the finger at except you so trust me it's happened yes yeah um but so that's that's been a learning curve and even as our staff is growing our resident staff and we have um we've gone from two to four um full-time staff okay. um 
but uh but that even even just adding that next two people the communication is so different and um trying to and, and we're looking at you know lord willing adding another one here in the next next year or two and uh dividing up responsibilities sometimes letting go of stuff that have been my responsibilities and figuring out how it's harder than you think what, where's the difference between <laughs> training and then just no this is how i want you to do it and so i've been working really hard this last year what do you think and then if i think differently trying to explain why mm -hmm. i would do it differently so that way they understand like my mindset but sometimes i have to analyze the end result is that is that still sufficient? Okay, you just you just do it your way. That makes sense. You go for it. And I'm trying to let go in different areas and pass as much of the decision making responsibility on to those people. Yeah, they talk about the eighty percent principle. Correct. I don't know how to quantify that though. <laughs> you it's know true. what I mean? Uh, it, it, it sounds good, but duties don't come with numbers. You know, right. when it comes to if they would do it eighty percent as well as I would, I don't know how to quantify that. Um, you know, you don't get into leadership without kind of being good at something, I would guess, at right. least in the best practice. Mm -hmm. And so your standards do kind of become those of the ministry at that level. And you'd like to pass that along and make sure people are well supported. But everyone's different. And, and part of it is just determining, is this just a difference? And right. I need to allow some creative you know, input or do I have to rule with an iron fist? And right. I think as your organization grows, you'll definitely have to be letting go of more and more of the well, detail. You, you've only got so much time. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the, if the I mean, the 80, 20, if they can do it to 80% of what I think I would do it, but I can go do something else that mm -hmm. wouldn't get done. We're actually, and that's, um, I mean, our camp grew, this is a really impressive number. Okay. When it comes to percentages. So we grew 80% this year over last year. Isn't that impressive? That's huge. That's awesome. So when it comes to actual numbers of campers, <laughs> well, so, don't ask. You know, like, we grew 80%. <laughs> so that means we grew like 40 some, 42 campers over the course of the three weeks of summer 42 camp that we souls. do. Um, 42 but souls. But a lot of that is we brought a new staff family on. And mm. so I was able to, a lot of stuff I usually would usually take up my time, I was able to pass off to one of those staff members. And so right. then I was able to do other things. And mm. so between the two of us, um, we were able to do more promotion and getting the word out. And I think part of that growth was that um, well, ability you, there. I mean, as the director, you have to, you're here on campus today, you're recruiting mm -hmm. counseling staff, I yes. would guess, or yep. just whoever will come to do whatever. And I would guess that that's probably kind of a volunteer ministry for the students to come and mm -hmm. you know most camps aren't like paying by the hour you know what nope. i mean uh it's a ministry and it's so awesome i've encouraged my sons to get involved in that and you know if the lord would open the door i understand college students got to pay their bills too right but i think what they find is when when they yield to the lord and he's called them to do that plus to do the college thing then he's going to provide right and so you're you're making that pitch, I know, and yes. I'm I'm backing you up on that. Yep. We've seen it happen time and time again every single year. Um, I tell our college students, you should take at least one summer and go serve in a camp situation. God will use that, change your life. Plus, there's a little bit of intermixing. You're going to be at other colleges recruiting, right. and they'll get to meet college students from all over, and uh, that's a good thing to see as well. Um, and I hope that that reinforces their choice that they came to Maranatha <laughs> and doesn't make them jealous of what they have at other places. Daniel, Daniel's here today helping us out. If you do camp, just make sure you come back to Maranatha <laughs> and, and pay your school bill. All right. So <laughs> there's always that side of it. I guess as we, as we kind of wrap the, the show up, I wonder, um, as you think back to your college years, because your path took a very different turn than what you probably thought it was going to look like as a high school kid. As you look back on everywhere God took you and as you've unfolded that story, talked about your core values and how I'm sure those didn't, you didn't start life with those, those no. developed along the way mm -hmm. as God taught you step by step. What, what one big piece of advice would you give to a college student that you're sort of mentoring or talking to about um, their concerns? How do I know what God wants me to do? And and how will I, what will my life look like? I want to know now, you know, all those kinds <laughs> of things that they, that they might ask about. But from your perspective, you're still a young guy, but you've got life experience to draw from. 
What's uh, what's a good piece of advice that you'd close with? Uh, I'd probably go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm-hmm. Um, Trust in the Lord with all in heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And um, we all want to know, like, we all, all these students, they would love to see where they are in 20 years. Like, that's what they think they want to know. Like, they want to know what God is. I mean, I've already talked with students this morning. <laughs> so what's your major? What are you going to do with that? Oh, I don't know. I haven't figured that. I have no clue what God wants me to do. Um, and really, the key is... Um, in my mind, what's the next thing that God wants you to do? And that might me be to get up tomorrow morning and study for that exam. You know, it's like, how can I be involved in my local church? Let me get up and read my Bible. Um, you know, do, do something that has something to do with personal discipline, but what's the next right thing that God wants me to do? And if I take that next step of obedience, he's going to take me down that path. He didn't say, trust in me with all your heart and I'll show you where you're going to end up. Mm. He said, I will direct your path. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so just just do the next right thing, and uh, and sometimes he gives us insight and burdens of like no this is what, this is what I want you to do um, as you're going. While you're the telling future. them that, are you like sliding them the camp application? I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I I do know God's will for their life. They That's just right. Have to figure it out. <laughs> well, no, I'm just. Teasing. I'm glad you asked, there, um, young man. Uh, actually, <laughs> but but honestly, the same thing. Like, um, do what's right and trust God. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to recruiting, I'm like, I don't know if this student that I'm talking to should be at camp this summer. So you don't want the wrong one. This is the value of camp. Mm. This is how I think God can use it to grow and stretch stretch you. But you need to pray. Is this what Lord, is this what you want me to do? And if he wants you somewhere else, you need to be somewhere else. And uh, so it's just whatever that next right step is. I love it. um, Do that. And he'll take you. He'll take you down the path of life. He'll get you where he wants you to go. And it probably isn't where you think you're going to go. But when you look back, you'll see what he was doing. Yeah. And uh, you kind of get a little bit of the overview, even though he has the big picture. And you're like, wow, God took me through that so that I could be ready for this. And I can see that all through my life as well. I love it. Do the next right thing. Let's do the next right thing. I love it. Hey, thanks for being on the podcast hey, and welcome. sharing your life experience. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to On Mission, a podcast produced by Maranatha Baptist University. If you're like me, the parent of a teenager right now, it seems the world has gone mad. Anti-God ideologies and liberal political philosophies dominate higher education. You're probably asking yourself, is there a college I can trust to build on my family's values in a biblical worldview? Thankfully, there is such a place. Maranatha Baptist University in Watertown, Wisconsin is dedicated to training young people to serve the Lord. MBU provides a safe environment to study, practice, and grow their faith and develop lifelong relationships with Christian young people that share their biblical values. And you don't have to compromise one bit on the academic quality of your education to receive it from a Christian worldview. Find out more at mbu.edu. For information about our podcast guests and to listen to all the previous episodes, visit mbu.edu slash podcast. Join us again next week as we examine what keeps leaders on mission.